Hello, and welcome to the Center for Health Design's Evidence-Based Design Journal Club. Thanks for joining us, and apologies for the couple of minutes we were running late. I'm Alan Card, a research associate with the Center for Health Design, and I'll be your host for today's session. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Health Environments Research and Design Journal for providing free access to the articles we typically review. If you have not already done so, we recommend subscribing to HERD. There's a discount code for attendees to receive 10% off the subscription. The purpose of the Evidence-Based Design Journal Club is to engage the healthcare design community in dialogue regarding important research to help us better understand the links between the built environment and health-related outcomes and to apply that understanding in the real world. Continuing education units are available for this webinar from the AIA and from EDAC. To receive credit for your participation, you can download the forms at any time by clicking on the Show My Media Library icon, which is located on the top toolbar where the red arrow is pointing. You'll have access to the AIA quiz, the EDAC form, and today's presentation slides. To download a file, click the green arrow next to the file. When you've finished, click the double right, the, click the double right arrow in the top left corner of the media library. The library will close and the slides will refill the empty space. For EDAC credit, complete the verification form and retain it for your records. You'll need to submit the form to Castle Worldwide mm -hmm. at the time of For AIA credit, complete the verification quiz, purchase a CEU management fee for $10 from CHD's store, and submit the verification form to Catherine Anchetta. She'll upload the credits to your AIA account. You'll find Catherine's email address included on the form. Please note that there is some resolution loss in the conversion of the PDF slide. The PDF will be available to download during the Q&A session from the media library icon we just discussed in the top right corner of your screen. I'd like to take a moment to review how to use the chat feature so that you can ask questions or submit comments on what you hear today. As shown on this slide, just type into the chat box where the red arrow is pointing. Please be sure to chat your questions to all so that all attendees in today's call are able to see your message. If, on the other hand, you're having any technical difficulties, please type your issues to moderator in a private conversation and we'll see how we can help. I'd now like to introduce you to the authors of the article we're discussing today, Kara Freiholder, Freihofer, and Dennis Vonasek. Kara Freihofer, PhD, is a senior research specialist at HGA Architects and Engineers, where she focuses on utilizing evidence-based design principles to inform and educate healthcare clients and colleagues on design decisions. Furthermore, Kara serves as the co-chair of the Research Council, where she helps spearhead research initiatives across all disciplines firm-wide. Throughout her tenure at HGA, Kara has authored several research articles. The most recent publication is entitled Making the Case for Practice-Based Research and the Imperative Role of Design Practitioners in Health Environments Research and Design Journal. She has also presented research findings at various national research conferences, mm -hmm. such as the Design and Environmental Design Research Association. This year, she was awarded IDRA's Certificate of Research Excellence, CORE, for an investigation that explored staff communication, efficiency, and patient privacy of an on-stage, off-stage clinic module. In 2012, she received a PhD in design research from the University of Minnesota. Her doctoral research evaluated the relationship between indoor environmental quality of sustainability facilities and user perception. Kara has also received a Master's of Science in Design degree from Arizona State University in 2009 and a Bachelor's of Science from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in Interior Architecture and Design in 2004. Dennis Bonasek, AIA, ACHA, CID, is Vice President and Healthcare Principal with HGA Architects and Engineers in Minneapolis. His expertise includes medical planning, project management, and design for diverse healthcare projects and scales nationally and internationally. He previously has presented healthcare planning topics at major industry conferences, including Healthcare Design Expo and Conference, Healthcare Facility Symposium, Symposium AFI PDC, and ACE Summit and Reverse Expo. He has a Bachelor of Architecture and Bachelor of Arts and Environmental Design from North Dakota State University. Thanks to both of you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. As I mentioned, thank you. 
As I mentioned, we're hosting this event to identify the everyday practical applications of research findings in a published article. Today's featured article, Setting the Stage, a comparative analysis of an ongoing of an on-stage, off-stage, and a linear clinic modules from the Health Environments Research and Design Journal. On today's call, we'll have an active discussion, including you, our listeners, uh, about different key factors in your study. And now, without any further ado, I'll let Karen Dennis take it away. Thank you, Alan. Okay. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have this wonderful presentation on a research that we have uh, completed doing the data collection analysis on in 2015. Um, and we'll talk briefly more about why we decided to do this particular type of investigation as a firm. Uh, we really wanted to understand how these different clinic modules are influencing efficiency and flow perception of care um, and satisfaction of the users, both staff and from the patient side. We also know that there's an urgent need, um, especially as care activities are moving to the ambulatory care setting in the next 10 years. I think we're kind of in the midst of this now. We're going to see a 15 to 23% growth in ambulatory uh, services, mainly because of the advancements in technology um, and then the redirect of where the focus of care should be. So because of that, we know that some of our ambulatory facilities right now are poorly designed and they're fragmented and they don't optimize um, efficiency. So with that, we decided to take on this investigation. We had a wonderful opportunity with a client that was willing and wanting to be partake in this, this particular study. We also had a really good setup um, with the projects and the scale of it and the scope of it, which we'll get into shortly. So this is um, the research design is really centered around a time and emotion study. Uh, we integrated a mixed method approach, and we do this so we can start triangulating our results. Uh, we want to understand and justify findings from one uh, method that we use with another method that we use. So we'll talk about that as we get into the result sections, how we have uh, done so. And it was really about staff and patient movement, their behaviors, and then also their perceptions. So we'll talk about the clinic modules. This is uh, this is Dennis, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the modules themselves. Um, so this particular client um, has two locations um, that were approximately two to three miles apart. And what we did was we studied the existing, or was existing at the beginning of this project, linear module, and we compared that to the newly constructed on and off stage module. Um, so the original linear model um, was adjacent to a new healthcare facility constructed, actually it was new, in 2000, um, which was very cutting edge at the time in some of the patient processes, um, specifically on the inpatient side. Uh, the outpatient side really focused more on what would have been a traditional clinic layout at that time. So the existing module uh, is approximately 32 rooms and two procedure rooms, which equates to a PAR level of 611 feet, as opposed to our new onstage, offstage module, uh, which is just slightly smaller, uh, but has less uh, exam rooms at 22 rooms. Uh, and um, perfect, thank you, Gar. Um, so just kind of a typical layout. I'm sure many of you have seen this type of uh, facility before um, as far as how they're organized. So we have the orange, which is the, uh, the, the rows of uh, the actual exam rooms. All of the exam rooms are double loaded and feed into the green or the staff support space in the middle. Um, so you have 11 exam rooms on both sides. Uh, and then you have a shared procedure room, more or less in the center of that plan, also in orange. Um, that is directly adjacent to the lab. And that's obviously shared between both uh, entities. 
uh, and that is fronted off of the main lobby space um, with minimal waiting. You can see how little waiting there actually is in this space, uh, along with um, kind of the uh, registration and the after visit follow up space. Now, the staff spaces are on the far right of the plan, uh, and you probably remember there was uh, essentially uh, staff conference rooms right in the bottom corner, and then above that, a small office area. So, this uh, the view on the right is the core area. Uh, this was in a new location. It was essentially a strip mall um, under construction. So we were able to come back in and provide some skylights to get some additional natural light into that area. Uh, and then you'll see on the left is kind of a view uh, showing the proximity of the patient exam rooms to the core. And then you'll also notice just beyond that um, computer station uh, door, uh, and those are for the nurse servers which apply to each of these rooms. Next slide, please. So this is the layout of the on-stage, off-stage. As you can see, all of the rooms are double loaded, uh, and they do have a nurse server. Um, the nurse server actually, uh, one of the things that was changed during the construction process, it was originally located where it's shown in this plan, um, and during the design process through the mock-ups, it was decided to shift that tight to the corner. Um, and, and flip some things as well as you're moving through it. So you're seeing that reflected in this plan. So that was a change that happened during the design process as far as moving that. Um, the nurse server is essentially you stock the room from the core, uh, and then you can open it from the inside to allow the staff to take product in and out, uh, thereby allowing more available time in the exam rooms because the staff doesn't have to stock it, um, only when it's empty. Um, you'll also notice that the doors, um, both doors swing in, uh, and then across the bottom of the plan, we have a curtain that pulls across. Um, this is a fairly typical layout we have developed with this client. The curtain is there specifically for additional family members or interpreters uh, that may need to be uh, in the space at the same time as them as the patient and the physician. So now we're going to look at the linear model, module, excuse me, um, that again was, was originally designed in 2000. That's essentially 32 exam rooms um, with two procedure spaces. And the procedure spaces are right in the center of the orange. Um, there is a cross corridor at midpoint, which is essentially functions as a staff zone. Um, for all of their charting, et cetera. And then we have another larger staff area in green at the bottom of the pod. I should mention, um, when, when we compared these two clinics, this linear module uh, was, as I said, built in 2000. Um, this area all has been renovated, so that was part of our process here, kind of a multi-phase renovation and relocation, actually of five clinics um, to free up space in the facility to create a cancer care center. So this area now has been renovated uh, and turned into a cancer care. So that's um, all as part of the process. As we're seeing with the, the move to get inpatients off of, excuse me, outpatients off of the campus and out into the community. So these are some existing photos of what was there um, in the linear module, uh, pretty typical 2000 clinic construction design. Um, on the far right is a very nice waiting area which overlooks the gardens, uh, and we did manage to keep that in a renovated fashion um, for the next phase as well. So this is showing what the existing exam room, thousands and thousands of these built all over the country. It's essentially a 10 by 12 room at 112 square feet. So it's about 24% smaller than the other uh, exam room that I showed you, uh, a pretty typical layout. All right, so now we'll get into the research design. Um, when we start these investigations, being from practice-based research side, um, I do a lot of hands-on conversation with the design team. We know we had a great opportunity for this particular type of project um, and, a, and a client that was willing and wanting to work with us. 
So we, we ask questions like, what is really important? What were some of the main topic points when you're doing design that we should particularly focus on in this type of investigation? They came back to me with assumptions. Um, they said, well, you know, we call this more of a collaborative model. We anticipate that the staff will, um, it will help the staff communicate. It will help them with collaboration. We also anticipate that there might be some more travel on the staff side because of the larger module itself, because the rooms are larger and there's more space. Uh, but we are uh, planning this around more efficient workflows and therefore the patient throughput should be quicker and their perception of privacy since uh, patients now have their own corridor area um, mm. and the staff will not be occupying that corridor area as much, uh, their perception of privacy should decrease too. So we designed a research around these particular assumptions. And that involved the mixed method approach. We did staff shadowing um, in 90 minute segments. We wanted to track their location, their time, as they enter and exit uh, specific areas, any tasks that they performed um, uh, throughout the unit or throughout the module, excuse me. But we did not enter the patient room. That was a restriction from IRB. Um, and then on the patient side, we wanted to understand their throughput. We wanted to do uh, uh, indirect observations. So uh, we uh, asked the question if we could do some direct shadowing, and the IRB came back and said, well, that might not be the best approach. We're afraid that the patients might feel that that's a little intrusive, and then also they may change their flow or their movement. So we did indirect observations. To do this, we needed to sit in two different locations in both the units so we can get a good estimation of throughput time. Um, so we sat in the waiting area and then we sat in the back house uh, in the public corridor area to understand their throughput in the exam room. And that was actually really great for us because um, as we are tracking these individuals, we can understand as people are entering and exiting the exam room. So we know how much time they're spending then with the providers and how much time they're actually waiting. Um, and we, so at the end of the day, we had almost 90 hours of shadowing and observation data tracked, which is quite significant. And we did this over the course of three different visits. And each visit, visit was roughly two to three days long. Um, and we would go back and forth between the clinics so that we had a very diverse sample size. Uh, the sample represented it, uh, different care providers and different patients that visited the clinic on those days that we were there for observations. We also distributed a patient questionnaire. Um, this was really to understand their uh, perception of privacy, the perception of wait time, and then also other elements of the design and clinical operations. We distributed a staff questionnaire, but we had a relatively low sample size on that. The patient questionnaire um, was roughly around, we got around 250 or so respondents among the two different clinics. So we'll jump into the research results and then also um, provide some discussion as we're walking through them. Uh, this in all these results and most of the discussion pieces are in the paper um, for reference. And so this graph in particular represents the uh, overall time spent by staff by in an eight-hour day shift. So um, it's an aggregate of all the data that we collected among the two different clinics. And uh, what we what is pretty significant here, um, as you look at the graph, is that most of the um, the uh, time on the, in the on-stage, off-stage clinic, those staff are spending in that staff core. And then it goes to the exam room and then traveling. Um, we did a comparison, a significant um, test among the two different clinics of the like areas, and in particular, spending significant more time in the core around an hour and uh, 1.7 hours more per staff and they're spending significant less time traveling, around 27 minutes per staff. Uh, 
there was no significant difference in the time that they were spending in the exam room. So what this is telling us is that we are organizing this layout to be more efficient to um, the workflow process, and we have more diagrams to support that. Uh, we are considering the immediate adjacencies, and in fact, they're not traveling more, which is one of the assumptions that could have happened. Um, they're actually seen here traveling less. This next slide shows the impact of staff communication. Now, this is the statistic um, demonstrates their face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, it was assumed that they would have more face-to-face -face interactions because these staff are now in a more collaborative core hub area, um, when in fact we did not see a significant difference. They're actually relatively equal, around uh, 45 minutes or so. In an eight-hour day shift, they are having some, some sort of face-to-face -face interaction with other care providers. Uh, but we did a further analysis to understand, well, maybe this might impact their, uh, the length of their communication events may be impacted. And we did not find a significant difference in that either. Um, now, what we're trying to get at, which is the communication piece, is um, does this endorse uh, collaboration at all? Um, and I'm not, we're not saying that it doesn't. It was just one nugget of information from this particular study. What we're doing now in a future study that um, we're collecting data on is understanding the quality of communication. Um, so what type of communication is occurring? Is it um, care plan coordination? Is it um, medication discussion? Or is it just social interaction? Um, and where in the collaboration hubs or in these core areas are, is that occurring and who's occurring with. So that's a follow-up study that we are now collecting to do. Uh, this graph, I'm sorry, I apologize for the graphics. Again, we had trouble with uploading the PowerPoint, but it just demonstrates now where a majority of this communication is occurring. Um, so most of this communication in the on-stage, off-stage is occurring in that core area. And what's great about that is that it shields the clinic staff activity away from the public view and earshot. Um, so separation of the private and public areas lessens the likelihood of patient privacy um, and their information being overheard by others. And it also helps reduce the congestion in the corridor, not just with the staff, but you know other medical equipment that could possibly be there. Cara, I see a question um, that could refer to your back last slide. You can go back one. Ryan is asking which module is which. Um, the module on the left, the on stage, off stage is Tamarack, and the linear module is uh, Woodwinds. There you go. So, the, uh, another statistic that we um, analyzed was the frequency of their movement from one location to another location. Um, so what we found in this particular uh, graph is that uh, there wasn't no significant difference in uh, their movement. Their, so as they moved to one area and moved to another area and moved to another area, they're actually relatively uh, similar on 130 at events in an eight-hour shift one staff member, um, but you can see that a majority of that movement in the on-stage, off-stage, majority of their movement, over 50, around 56% is now between the exam room and the staff core. Again, just providing evidence of a more efficient workflow. Now we uh, demonstrated through time that their, their time spent traveling had significantly decreased. We translated that information, the data that we gathered, and we put it into a floor plan, and we spaghetti diagrammed it. And by doing so, we can estimate, get a really great accurate number on the distance that they traveled. Um, so that's what these two diagrams demonstrate. Um, on stage, off stage is on the left. And although the clinic is larger, this particular comparison study did not um, actually showed a significant difference in their distance traveled, but the on-stage, off-stage clinic, they're traveling over a half a mile less in a day. So um, again, another tale to speaking 
um, speaking to the efficiency of the floor plate and how this is now tailored to the particular workflow process. Um, in this particular floor plan, though, we did notice some workarounds that were observed. Um, in particular, the staff were frequently observed cutting through the exam rooms to get to the center core area where the lab and the subway are for the lab. Um, so they would cut through the double door when there was nobody in there <laughs> um, and, and, and access that center core area. Uh, we also noticed that the staff in the far left module would uh, had a pretty far way to travel to get to the staff break area. So they would either cut through or they would um, travel in the, the north corridor along the window wall. Um, so with some of that understanding, what we've been implementing in some of our more recent projects that are um, emulate it from this project, is that uh, we'd be providing a passageway between the exam room to the center core area uh, so that it can decrease some of this work around. Um. Next slide. One other thing, too, with that that um, we have started to do is that instead of that fixed, um, patient space on the far right, excuse me, staff space on the far right. We put that across the back of the, or the top of the onstage, offstage to help those um, staff be in closer proximity to that break area if we have the depth in the floor plate. Next slide. So the other area that we saw uh, a big difference was the patient throughput time. And I see my old friend Rebecca Lewis is asking a question regarding the square footage difference uh, between the linear and the uh, uh, the linear module and the offstage module. And I think this is the biggest um, the biggest uh, way to help a client understand that it may cost more from a construction perspective because you are um, building more space uh, and you're making those exam rooms larger but you're able to get quicker patient throughput. So on an average, we saw 16.85 minute quicker uh, patient turnaround on the onstage and offstage. Um, that can be attributed to essentially three factors. Um, one being the wait time in most cases was less in the onstage or offstage. Uh, the wait time in exam rooms uh, was less uh, by approximately six minutes. And that wait time in the exam room would be the time for the physician to come into the room. Um, on an average, we saw six minutes uh, in the onstage, offstage. And on the linear model, we saw 12 minutes on an average. Um, so that's a pretty big delta between those. And then the follow-up at the end of the appointment, um, was that was approximately four minutes shorter in the onstage, offstage. So this uh, additional... So you factor that and you think about what that can mean as far as the construction cost and um, the additional um, space that is required. And our client um, pointed out that if for a family practice group, you could see anywhere from five to six additional patients with that 16 minutes in a day. So you take and you extrapolate that five to six patients out, uh, whatever their average insurance uh, premiums and payments are, um, that's a pretty big number, uh, and that is a, that is the argument that we have used since this study and several times um, to convince people that uh, the additional score footage is well worth the efficiency gain from that. So hopefully that answers your question, Rebecca. Thank you. So we also saw um, in the perception of weight a significant difference between the two modules. They were much more um, and the agreement that their wait time was more satisfying in the onstage, offstage, both in the waiting area, their wait in the exam room, and their wait in the lab in the pharmacy. Um, so another way that we're triangulating the results with other methods and justifying what we're seeing. And we know that providing them with um, a better waiting experience can be directly associated to an increase in their patient satisfaction 
scores through the CCAPS, and then also that it can influence the retention of your um, population. We asked in the questionnaire to 10 questions related to the perception of privacy. Um, this graph shows the five questions that are positively, positively directed. So we're supposed to get a positive response in these questions. And then the next graph um, will show the five questions that are negatively directed. And these questions were taken in the literature, um, from the literature on privacy of care um, from a previous study. What we, and it, they ask particular questions along the patient journey. So some of their experiences, how in general important their privacy is, and if it was upheld, if it met their expectations, their privacy during their waiting, um, checking in and, and leaving, and then also their privacy while in the exam room. And what we have found is that there is no significant difference in the perception of privacy among the two different clinic modules. Actually, uh, most of these respondents are, responses are relatively um, equal among the two clinics. Um, what we can see from the results is that their privacy is very important to them. They felt like their privacy was upheld. Um, uh, they're more satisfied with their privacy in the exam room than the check-in and check-out procedures. Uh, so this warrants another study about what during that check-in and check-out procedure, how can we enable a more uh, private experience for the, uh, the patients as they are um, entering and leaving the clinic. Both clinic modules had what you would typically see for check-in and check-out. Um, you know, reception area with some privacy panels. So there wasn't a significant difference in that. Um, there were some rooms that are available for scheduling and follow-up in the on-stage, off-stage modules. Um, but ma majority of the time, these were either occurring in the exam room or um, back at the schedules, scheduler's desk. So in conclusion, just a summary. Um, really based off of the assumptions that I mentioned earlier of the results. So we did not see a change in the communication among the two clinics. We saw that in the on-stage, off-stage clinic, they are um, physically traveling over half a mile less in a day, and that the, the patient throughput times are roughly 17 minutes quicker. Um, and that's mostly attributed to the wait time, which is around 13 minutes of the 17 qu uh, quicker minutes in the patient's report. And that uh, there was, in fact, no difference in the perception of privacy of the patient. So a couple more questions have popped up here. Um, Tammy is asking about teaching medical or nursing students. Uh, both of these clinics do have an education aspect. They're not a uh, academic medical center, but they do have residents um, that are part of that uh, teaming uh, core area. Um, and they basically just occupy a couple of the 14, um, one of the 14 or two of the 14 workstations within that core. So, um, Tammy also asked a question about noise and privacy issues with staff talking freely in the core. Um, this is one of those things that we kind of a lessons learned as we have gone through this. We have replicated this layout multiple times, um, and this was probably the third or the fourth uh, generation from where we originally started. Um, we learned in the first that we needed to uh, we needed to provide a white noise system within that central core. So that is now part of our standard protocol. Uh, it's not a significant cost, uh, but it does uh, add slightly to that construction value. And by adding that white noise, that pretty much takes care of any of the concerns um, as far as privacy within that core um, and the adjacency to those patient rooms. Do we lose you? No. 
or I'm just reading through these questions and chime in if you'd like. Okay. Okay, if you guys are ready for the Q&A, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, that section. Um, and now it is your turn to ask questions of the authors. Please feel free to type in any questions you may have, as many of you have already been doing, and we'll try to answer them. Um, but before we do that, uh, I'd like to say again thank you to HERD, the HERD Journal, for providing free access to the articles we typically review. And if you would like to subscribe to the HERD Journal, go to www.herdjournal.com and use code HERD10 to receive 10% off the annual subscription. So we have a, a whole bunch of questions already lined up, and uh, we will try to get through them all to the best of our ability. Uh, the first one that I have here is from Rob, and he asks, was there any difference in the number of, number of patients seen per day between the two uh, designs? So um, the number of patients, we didn't really look at their throughput per day. Uh, we didn't gather that statistic, but I can tell you that in the on-stage, off-stage module, because it is a newer clinic um, and it was a, a newer area that's being built up, they worked at max capacity. So you didn't see, um, you saw some delays. There was times when there was a couple hours between appointments um, with some of the patients. Uh, but we had a really good comparison in the study design, essentially, knowing that these care providers um, actually chose, they were given the option which clinic you would like to work in. So the ones that moved on to this on-stage module, on off-stage module in that particular location actually chose to move on to that. Great. Um, Begum had a question about flow, and I've seen another couple that are kind of similar. Uh, this one was, when patients come into the clinic and when the exam time comes, how do you guide patients in the on-stage, off-stage clinic modules? And perhaps related, uh, were the processes the same in each location? So the processes were very similar, um, and that's why we could do the comparison of the study. Um, I didn't quite understand the first question. I believe it was about how you got patients through the um, on stage, through from the waiting room to the exam room. Was my understanding? Of the question. Right. So the observations when we did those observations, um, we we just sat in the waiting area for two hours, and we tracked. We would track one person as they enter into the facility, um, did the checkup went to the waiting, and then were called back. And as soon as they entered the door to the back of the house area, we would stop that observation and then track a new observation. Uh, and then we would go in the back of the house and track the patients in a similar fashion. As soon as they entered the back of the house, track them throughout their journey as, as long as they uh, exited. So we got a, a true understanding. We didn't follow one patient from the beginning to the end. We were not allowed to do that, but we were able to track a lot of patients in um, the time allotted that we had uh, to do the observation. Great. Question I would from... wonder, I'm wondering if there's a wayfinding question that is also being asked with how that question was phrased. Um, it's pretty intuitive when you look at the layout. It's corridors one through six, and you tell the patient that go down, go down corridor one and go into exam room five, or corridor three and go into exam room six. Um, we have done it where we use everything from icon iconography, iconography rather, at um, the entrance, and we've also done it with color, um, depending upon what that individual clinic is. Okay. And what was and, particularly uh, nice that we heard from patients actually is when they do exit um, the exam room, they look down one end of the corridor and it's mm -hmm. actually window light. So they know yep. not to go that way. That's not the way up. They look down the other end of the corridor and they see the extended corridors. So they know to go that direction. That's good. Escaping from the doctor's office has always been a challenge <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, so we had a, another question just to clarify then. is Was it uh, a receptionist or a clinician who came out and told the patients where to go? 
It was the clinician. It was it was the MA. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Um, David Edwards asks, how much of the benefits seen were from the consolidated staff space versus the second hallway? Obviously, that calls for some speculation. So the benefit of the consolidated staff space, um, well, what we're seeing in this consolidated space on these, on some of the subsequent studies that we've done since is that there's a lot more um, what we would call teamness. So the clinician team is working you know, really efficiently. They can see themselves, they can see the, their, their clinician members or their clinic members as they are m working through um, an appointment. Um, and then even after the appointment's done, when they have to do some follow-up, they're taking notes, they're calling people. I mean, they're right next to each other. Um, the physician is answering questions while the MA is on the phone scheduling appointments or um, verifying medica medications with the pharmacist. So we're seeing a lot more um, teamness in the totality of the, that, that particular team, the physician. I don't know if that answers it. That's fantastic. Now, that reminds me of how the, the emerging literature on centralized versus decentralized nursing stations is finding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How people work together when they move between one and the other, but also how their social interaction or lack thereof affects their satisfaction. Now, that wasn't obvious focus of this paper, but I wonder if you, in the course of conducting the study, gathered any qualitative sense of how this affects their social interaction. So it's interesting because we do a very similar method and approach when we um, look at inpatient units too. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen when they move from a centralized environment to a decentralized environment, you know, clients are very apprehensive about it because they think it's going to really impact their face-to-face um, -face and social interaction and teamness with um, the other nurses and the other physicians on the, the unit. But similar results, we actually don't see a significant difference in the total time of face-to-face -face interaction, whether it's in decentralized or centralized. It's just where that is occurring now is in a different location. It's more conducive location. Great. Uh, Steve Lavender asks, wouldn't the patient throughput times be affected by different patient populations, specialty mm -hmm. and feeds at one clinic, mm -hmm. but not at the other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these... Yes. Uh, that's, that's a good observation. Dennis, do you want to speak to that? I was just going to mention that we had the basic same type of patient populations across both clinics. Um, it's more about the time that it was spent. This is an average these numbers were sharing. Um, the pediatrics was at the base clinic and it's at this clinic now. But you're right, they will vary according to um, what those specialties are. Cara, did you have anything to and add? And that's one of the limitations of the study is that we can't determine when a patient enters the door what specialty they're going to. <laughs> Um, so that's why we try to make it um, a higher sample size, and we're there three different times and just collecting a variety of data. And then with the design of this particular clinic, because they have relatively similar specialties at both clinics, um, that we felt like this was a good comparison study. Fantastic. Um, Patrick Leahy asks, linear OPT? had more time for both the linear option, I guess, uh, had more time for both lab and work area and dictation, very little on on-stage, off-stage. Is dictation in the exam rooms? Could you, does that explain the difference in lab time? So a lot of that now is occurring in the core area. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's what would explain that. There's no separate dictation areas. The physicians actually stayed in the core area. There's only one mm -hmm. physician office where the physician manager of the clinic Otherwise, they stayed in that core area. Great. Uh, Justin asks, are there any other lessons learned as you have seen organizations transition to onstage, offstage? Nice broad question. So uh, I, I, in a subsequent study, oh, sorry, Dennis, you can go ahead. Well, um, um, 
I'll, I'll preface this with um, obviously I'm the architect and Kara is the research person, but intuitively some things that we've done differently. Um, we have moved towards sliding doors in some cases instead of swinging doors with the hope of adding more um, space or, or rather not taking up as much space in the room. Um, we have found, though, that you have to buy very good quality sliding doors. You can't, you know, do the standard barn door that you would use in most applications. So even though it's less square footage, the cost of the door is significantly more. Um, I mentioned uh, white noise. That's something that we try to push as well, um, specifically with that. Um, one other module that we've had some challenges with, um, with the same layout, I should say module exam room, um, where a patient opted, or excuse me, the, the, the facilities folks opted not to put the curtains in, um, and there, there seems to be an ongoing issue with um, patients coming in their room um, incorrectly. So we've tried to address that with locks, et cetera. Um, and seem to have found a solution, but uh, again, another lesson learned. If we would have done a different type of lock on that outside corridor door, the door where the patients come and go, um, or just so an occupied switch is another way to do it um, to make sure that we're addressing that issue. So those are a couple lessons learned, not necessarily from this project, but since we've completed this project. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to point out that this really takes into account um, the people, process, and the space. We can design a space, support a process, but it's really about the people of the space to um, work it the way that it's supposed to. And I say that because in a more recent study that we did, we looked at a clinic module that was somewhat of a hybrid and an on-stage, off-stage, and it's, they still had to design with physician offices for various reasons. Uh, and we looked at a team where the physician always went back to the office after each of the appointment versus a team where the physician sat in the core area with um, the t other team members. And what we saw was a significant decrease in um, the amount of interaction and communication and team in those two different types of uh, different forms of providing care in a cancer clinic. So I, I mentioned that it really is an equal thing. We designed a space, we operationalized it, but it's really about the people to own the space and operate in it the way that it was intended to. Great, and both your answers reminded, Dennis, I think you said earlier that the nerve server got moved from where you originally right. had designed yep. it. I was wondering what you uncovered that drove that decision. Uh, we built mock-ups. We try to build mock-ups of all of our spaces uh, and getting the staff in the room uh, in the mock-up became pretty evident that they didn't like the way the door on the, um, on the inside of the room uh, for the nurse server interacted with the door um, and the location of the, um, the door coming into the room and the location of the bed. So it just kind of evolved and slid over and uh, we went from a pass-through server to a side server to address that. That makes sense. By side server, I mean a 90 degree versus right through. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Linda Gable asks, how did you address noise control in the central core? And uh, I was jumping on. I'm reading these as they pop up. So I didn't realize, Alan, that you answered all the questions at the end. So I apologize for that. But uh, okay. as I mentioned, we are, that's where we provide the white noise system. Uh, we suspend those cans, essentially, uh, in that central zone um, to make sure that uh, there's some sort of a constant buzz happening um, in that space. So that's another one of those lessons learned. Fantastic. Um, she also asks, did you compare your patient survey results with mailed uh, press Ganey scores? Uh, we have not. Um, we've uh, worked with the client to see if we can receive such scores, but we have not been able to do so yet. Common problem, and then their low power anyway makes mm -hmm. it difficult. Um, right. But everybody, it seems like it should be useful. Um, it's very useful. Uh, I'm sorry? It's very, they're very useful scores. 
not just with Operation Fleet with Design. Yeah. And uh, what kind of tools did you use for traffic tracking the staff and patients? Uh, so we use, um, it's an Apple app, it's called Work Study Plus 5. Uh, this is a really nice app, we used it for both of the observations on the patient and the staff side. We also use it for inpatient. It's nice because it lets us do immediate time stamping um, and then develop our own template um, and customize them. We can customize them in the field when, if we need to. Um, and then it exports it into an Excel document. It's relatively um, inexpensive too, um, and there's a lot of flexibility with it. Very cool. Uh, Rebecca Lewis asked, can you share if your studies of staff responses um, between seasoned nurses and new nurses when assimilating to the new on-stage, off-stage module? That's an interesting um, comparison. Yeah. Um, we, like, we only reported on the patient responses, um, and we didn't get a high enough staff response in one of the clinic so we couldn't do a very good comparison of that. Um, but it's a, it, that's a, a really good point and something to think of for future reference. Um, Michael Couch asks, what if there were no waiting room? How might that change perceptions of privacy? Mm -hmm. So they were there. Dennis, do you have anything? Well, you can see from the layout that we have significantly less waiting uh, in the onstage, offstage than we do in the linear. And that's what we're okay. seeing as far as a trend. They're just getting smaller and smaller because you're getting those patients into that uh, exam room quicker uh, and hopefully turning them around quicker if, if you have all the people mm -hmm. process and uh, things all in place. Um, no exam room, uh, I think that would be interesting. Uh, I think that would no, help with privacy. But I also think that there often is an entourage of people that come along uh, with the patient. And to have all of them waiting in the exam room with the patient, I think, could be somewhat problematic. So I don't know if you'll ever get rid of the exam room, but I do see them getting greatly smaller. That's, that's my thought. How about you, Cara? And, oh, uh, I have a request. Can I please ask Kara to repeat the name of the Apple app? Uh, work Study Plus Five. Five. And we have time for one last question, and I'll throw that one out there. Uh, you mentioned this is part of an ongoing body of work. You've done more stuff since you have additional research plans to follow up on this. Could you tell us a little bit about what's coming up down the pike? Yeah, uh, we are looking at academic models and comparing uh, how uh, the staff are communicating in different types of academic modules in different types of on-stage, off-stage configurations. Um, so that is one, actually it's done and we're writing the um, paper on that right now. And then uh, we have another one that will be coming out that I mentioned on the Cancer uh, Center. A, can a newly de designed hybrid model, not really on stage, off stage, but has a collaboration hub in the back of the house um, that compares uh, teams and the way how different teams work and then how that influences their workflow patterns and communication. Fantastic. Well, thank you both very much, Karen and Dennis, for this interesting and thoughtful look into how two ambulatory modules can impact operational efficiency, patient throughput, staff collaboration, and patient privacy. Uh, and thanks also for fielding all of those questions. There were some that we still couldn't get to. People were very excited about this paper, and we had a lot of people show up for it. Really appreciate your time. This concludes our event. We'll leave the webinar open for another 30 minutes so you can download the EDAC and AIA CEU forms. Thanks again for joining us, everyone. Have a great day.